Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is fractal epistemology. My guest is Terry Marks. Tarlow, a woman of many accomplishments. She is a psychotherapist. She writes librettos for operas that have been performed at the Lincoln Center in New York City. She's an artist herself, a poet and a dancer. She is author of The Mirrors of the Mind, Psychotherapist as Artist, Clinical Intuition in Psychotherapy, Awakening Clinical Intuition, Psyche's Veil, Psychotherapy, Fractals, and Complexity, Creativity Inside Out, Learning Through Multiple Intelligences. She is very interested in synchronicity and is co-editor of the volume, Simultaneity, Temporal Structures and Observer Perspectives. And she is also co-editor of the recently released volume, A Fractal Epistemology for Scientific Psychology. We're talking about a brilliant woman here who lives in Santa Monica, California. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Terry. What a pleasure to be able to converse with you today about fractal epistemology. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here and to talk about the fractal epistemology. And uh, to begin with, we're going to need to define our terms because I'm sure there are viewers who don't know what epistemology is and who don't know what fractals are, but both are terms that have been banging around the culture now for decades, if not centuries, at least with regard to epistemology. So uh, let's begin by defining epistemology. Okay, so an epistemology is a branch of philosophy, and it really has been around since uh, ancient Greek times, and it's a conceptual framework. Very simply, it's a conceptual framework, and an epistemology lies underneath our everyday framework as well. It's our, it's how we understand the world, how we understand ourselves, how we understand nature. As I understand it in simple terms, epistemology is the study of how we know anything at all. What distinguishes knowledge from opinion? Absolutely. And we contrast it with ontology, which is the study of being. So this is the study of knowing. And fractals now is a little harder probably to define, but let's give it a shot. Well, fractals are especially hard to define because the person who invented or discovered them, depending on how one views mathematics, wouldn't define fractals very carefully and closely. And so there are many, many different ways of understanding what a fractal is. But I will use a very simple one, which is it's a it's a way a form of patterning patterning and it is the way that nature tends to pattern itself and it is a shape it's a very holistic way of approaching patterning where the shape of the parts resemble either identically or approximately the shape of the whole and so one of the simplest shapes um, would be a branching pattern so the v of a branching pattern when it comes to the trunk, um, would separate into two, let's say, and then each of those branches would separate into two and they're ever smaller. So it's a, a um, pattern that either resembles itself on different size scales or different time scales or both. In other words, it's a recursive pattern. Exactly. It's a recursive pattern. And nature loves recursive patterns. Nature loves fractals. In fact, all of nature, pretty much, except the human 
human-made uh, side tends to have this kind of patterning and in different dimensions as well. Now, Benoit Mandelbrot, the mathematician who really identified fractals, I think in 1975, developed some very specific ones. In fact, the Mandelbrot, uh, his name is associated with a very familiar fractal design. We'll put one up on the screen so the viewers uh, can see it. It's, it's quite extraordinary, and it, it seems to suggest much more than merely a branching tree or a recursive design. Yes, this is true. It's infinitely deep. If you look at uh, the Mandelbrot set, which is the fractal you're, you're talking about, with the computer as a microscope and you zoom in any, in any part of it, you can go infinitely deep. And in fact, if the viewers want to go to YouTube, there are so many different Mandelbrot zooms where uh, the computer is left running and just going deeper and deeper into ever smaller areas of the Mandelbrot set. And it looks a little bit like a psychedelic trip. It looks like a bunch of uh, paisley patterns from the 60s and all kinds of seahorses and, um, and different structures. And one of the things that's so fascinating about that particular zoom is that you can look at the shape of the hole, which I like to call the Buddha bug, and some people call it the fingerprints of God, and people have different, or the, or the warded snowman, or whatever. There, people have different ways of describing the overall shape of it. Um, but as you go deeper and deeper, you will have these places where the shape of the hole. Um, recurs. And so you can see the self-similarity in that way. A lot of people may be thinking at this point, gee, these are really beautiful. This is really fascinating. But so what? And I'm reminded of a, a quote. You start your anthology about the fractal epistemology with a quote from the distinguished physicist John Archibald Wheeler, who says, in the future, nobody will be considered scientifically literate if they don't understand fractals. Yes, this is true. They are um, very practical. And in fact, it's, it's a kind of funny pattern that also holds for transpersonal psychology, where um, initially, the precursors to the Mandelbrot set were considered, quote unquote, monster curves and pathological. They were thought to be of no interest to anyone and of no relevance to the real world, uh, purely abstract shapes. But it turns out that that's not true at all and that the real world is much more complex than our uh, historically reductionist way of looking at the real world. And what I mean by reductionist is taking a complex shape and breaking it down into simple parts and then thinking that you can really capture that complexity by putting those parts back together again, a bit like a, a car, which absolutely does work that way. Mechanical things do. But if you think of a human body, we would never cut the body into little pieces and then think we could uh, put them all back together again and have a living human being. And so uh, there is a holistic quality to nature and especially to life in nature that uh, defies this way of of, of viewing. And, and that has been our conceptual framework for a really, really long time, this reductionist mechanistic view of, of complexity and of nature at large. And so it turns out that fractals are as practical as they can be. And um, I would say the physical sciences are recognizing that much uh, sooner than the social sciences. And so um, whether it's physics or biology or uh, neurology, the brain has all kinds of fractal shapes in it. Um, and of course, the human brain is the most complex brain <laughs> that we 
um, that we know, and there are more interconnections between the neurons of the brain than there are molecules in the universe. And so this level of complexity has really defied us until quite recently. Another point that I think is crucial to make is the role of mathematics in science, since fractals can be defined very precisely from a mathematical point of view, and pretty much all of science rests on mathematics of one form or another, except for some very interesting areas of qualitative science. Right. That's, that's absolutely so. All of our experiments uh, use mathematics and, and especially statistics, different forms of statistics, and linear statistics uh, are much more limited than nonlinear st statistics, and, and fractal geometry is part of nonlinear science. And so uh, one really important thing the epistemology does is it, it unifies all branches of science from the social sciences to, to the, the, the quote-unquote hard or the soft sciences to the hard sciences. In the past, psychology has had a real identity crisis. Freud wanted to unify uh, psychology with neurology, but the science didn't exist at the time. The, just, just the brain science was not advanced enough for him to achieve that. And actually, the uh, title of the fractal epistemology, um, a, a fractal epistemology for a scientific psychology, gives a nod to Freud because his was project for a scientific psychology, and I, I think that um, being able to have a single language that not only trans transcends the physical sciences but branches into the social sciences gives us a common way of talking about um, really complex patterns is really invaluable, especially because it helps to re-elevate psychology and other social sciences, sociology, back into the fold with the other sciences. There is one area that is particularly estranged from mainstream science. It probably is the whole transpersonal field and my specialty of parapsychology. And uh, one of your big interests is the Jungian concept of synchronicity, which has been uh, very controversial from the perspective of mainstream psychology, but I was very heartened to read in your anthology one of my heroes, Stanley Krippner, wrote, this is the book I've been waiting for. Finally, the field of transpersonal psychology can be united with mainstream science. So let, let's get right into that, Terry. Okay, and not only united, but I think rather than view transpersonal psychology at the edges of mainstream uh, psychology, it's more valuable from a fractal epistemological point of view to put it right in the center of things because uh, fractal within the fractal universe, it's the edges or the boundaries that reveal the most. And so I would say that your specialty of parapsychology and transpersonal is reveals these edges that show us the whole picture. And so, yes. Um, now, in terms of synchronicity, of all the, um, we'll say, non-local ways of understanding the universe, whether it's um, uh, um, like psychic things, mind reading, this sort of thing, synchronicity is the one that visits me the most. And I have this theory about um, all of the areas of parapsychology that much in the same way that people, each person has uh, a the sort of weakest point of stress. And so some people get headaches when they're stressed. Some people get stomach aches. Some people get anxiety or paralyzed or whatever. I think that each person has their own form of parapsychology or paranormal. Um, I'm not even crazy about the term paranormal. You probably have better ones. But I think that each person 
leans in one direction or another. And I, as a clinician, I'm a clinical psychologist, have always leaned towards uh, synchronicity as my form. And according to Jung, um, there, there are two different ways really of looking at synchronicity. I'm sure there are many more than two different ways, but, but there are two contrasting ways of, of looking. One that Jung identified is if you're stuck on the inside, then the outside's going to hit you over the head with a sort of patterning that's meaningful. So sy- synchronicity, of course, is meaningful coincidence. And, so if, if people are blocked emotionally or they have a complex coming up um, and they can't address it internally, sometimes the universe just hits us over the head with uh, something that's meaningful, that wakes us up, that helps us break through an impasse. Now, Deepak Chopra has a different way of looking at synchronicity. He views synchronicity as a higher state of consciousness. And the, his idea is that when everybody, um, or anybody really is able to, to get to these higher states, that things are more interconnected than what we're able to feel when we're at lower states of consciousness. So I would say clinically that um, I, I visit both ends of that spectrum. I think that I have the personality for synchronicity partly because I'm relatively insensitive as a, as a person. I think that people who are highly, highly sensitive emotionally to others and to, um, different, different things going on around them are more likely to be able to tap into mind reading and, and this sort of thing. But I tap, I tend to tap into patterning more from an external, external point of view. So synchronicity happens more and more to, to me over time, all the time. And, and it's one of those things that the more you tap, the more you think about it, the more you believe in it, the more you experience it, the more likely that it will continue. And, um, yeah, so that's, those are some thoughts about, uh, synchronicity. Now, in terms of fractals, um, the, the one way of understanding synchronicity is when the outside world is self-similar to the inside world. So there is there um, a, a recursive element or a self-similar element uh, happening that shows a continuity that isn't always available for direct experience. Well, one of the big controversies around synchronicity is Jung's designation that this is an a-causal but meaningful coincidence. Now, Jung drew a lot of inspiration for his theory from the work of J.B. Rhine and uh, with ESP, mind reading, as you described earlier, which is a different model. People thought of uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition as being causal somehow is fitting into a a materialistic framework. And that's been very problematic because we've never found a channel of information transmission nor an organ of information reception in the body. But the fractal theory, as I understand it, suggests that I would say that, that the causation of a synchronicity comes from a higher order, from what you call the, the Buddha body, for example, if, if we use the Mandelbrot theorem as uh, a, a model for what we're talking about. The recursive pattern can go from level to level to level to level to, until it shows up as a synchronicity. Exactly, exactly. Causal, causal connection is part of uh, uh, that reductionist framework that, that we were talking about where A leads to B and B leads to C and some kind of a linear progression that is 
easily recognizable. But that isn't, that isn't how things are connected in the real world. The, the a-causal connection, um, is, is a much more important one. And anybody who's interested in astrology, for example, is interested in a causal connection there. And really what that means is that there's a, or part of what it means is that there's a simultaneity in time. And so having things coexist in time, but not be causally connected to one another um, is is more um, is a more accurate, I think, way of understanding how everything everything is exists in time in, in ways that we don't tend to think of when we are thinking really abstractly um, because abstraction is timeless you know and ideas in some ways are timeless but that's not how nature works things are connected in by time by by appearing in the same moment and so um, you know I think astrology is a great example I'm not I'm not a huge, I was, I actually really did not like astrology at all because I don't want anyone to tell me what's going to happen in my future. And I don't believe in it because chaos theory tells us the future is fundamentally unpredictable. And so I really rejected the whole notion and premise of psycho, of, uh, of astrology until I began to think of it as coexisting patterns on different levels that tend to inform one another about the nature of, of each other. And when it's put in, in that kind of a framework, I can completely, um, complete, completely buy into it. Although I'm, I still am not very interested in it. So a causal connection is also the stuff of physics at the deep quantum level. And so, uh, this fractal, uh, approach may be able to help us unify these levels that haven't been unified before between this what what may be a, a quantum underpinning where everything is interconnected with everything else to um you know to to the surface level where we have not been able to cross that divide very easily but if we look at a cascading process up of if we're dipping into that pattern um at a quantum level somehow because everything is interconnected at this deepest level and then there are cascading patterns up to the macroscopic level, then suddenly um, things may be uh, more unifiable than simply a mystical um, uh, faith. So this is, I've always approached spirituality from a scientific point of view rather than a, a, a completely faith-based um, approach. And I think this, this really helps. Um, I think, I think that, that, uh, fractals are absolutely profound at, and, and always have. That was just, that was my gut, um, feeling is that there's something very, very profound about, about this, this form of patterning. Well, I remember back in 1975, which I think is the same year that Mandelbrot came up with his uh, theories and, and theorems regarding fractals, Carl Pribram at Stanford University, where I believe you did your undergraduate work, uh, had developed what he called the uh, holographic theory of uh, the mind-brain relationship and, and consciousness. And, and he pointed out certain qualities of holographs that seem to resemble what you're saying about fractals, that the you can take a holograph and cut it into tiny pieces, and each piece will be a reflection of the whole. Yes, and that certainly is was a, a, a profound precursor here, and um, and that model fits right in. Fractals are even more dynamic because one thing about a hologram is that the pieces are exactly the same as the whole. But in a fractal, they don't need to be exactly the same. So there's more, there's a lot of room for evolution, um, 
in in this multi-dimensional thing. And speaking of dimensions, I think that's one of the coolest thing about things about fractals. In and one of the things that really informs parapsychology is that fractals exist in the space between ordinary dimensions, and that's just. The same thing is maybe shamanic travel or dream verses and dreamscapes and, and this sort of thing. Um, much of the action of the universe happens in between, in this infinite, infinite space between finite dimensions. And so there too, you can inject the spirituality. Um, because some, some people, you know, going back to mathematics have thought about, uh, God as uh, infinity, and as simple as mathematical infinity, or some some mathematicians get some spiritual juice out of uh, viewing it that way. Um, and with fractals, there's an infinite expanse in between each of the dimensions, each of the ordinary dimensions, whether it's a single point or... Um, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, etc. Um, there's a whole expanse in there, and this really widens our sense of the possible, and it also bridges imagination with ordinary experience as well. This suggests, when we're thinking about epistemology, that fractals represent a framework through which we can, a lens, you could even call it, through which we can view the universe differently than if we think of it as a, a kind of mechanistic clockwork universe. Yes, exactly. I think that is the most fundamental use for the epistemology is as a lens for viewing things. And frankly, once people start to understand what a fractal is and understand how the clouds are all fractal and our trees and our landscapes, our river meanderings, etc., you won't be able to step outside without seeing them everywhere. And um, in fact, I, I think uh, uh, it's a little bit like the emperor's new clothes kind of thing. I think that young children are uh, gravitate naturally towards fractal shapes within nesting cups, all, lots of toys. And these are international toys. Um, are, are fractal shaped. Um, whether they're nesty cups, I have from Africa, I have little huts that one of which fit each of which fit inside the other and, and this sort of thing. And I have this really cool, um, drawing that my own daughter did when she was five that are these heart people. And I love to show that everywhere because pretty much every parent will identify how their children, when young, um, are experimenting and playing with fractal shapes, whether it's uh, circles of different sizes or triangles or diamonds or hearts. Um, children naturally experiment with these self-similar shapes. And, um, and so in some ways, we unlearn how to see the fractals uh, by being educated in a mechanistic, um, in a mechanistic framework. So wouldn't it be great if children could understand that they are playing with fractals when they do and people would not be so intimidated by math because this is actually in some ways super simple it's not it's not that complicated but it is a different lens and if you can't put those glasses on or if you're afraid to put anything mathematical on your face to see what's out there through it um, then, then you'll miss the, the incredible simplicity of, of the framework. My experience is that mathematical ideas do take a lot of time to infiltrate their way into the culture. I, as I recall, George Cantor developed set theory, which is now taught in elementary school mathematics, but the discovery was, I believe, over well over 100 years ago. Yes, that is true. And, and you pick a man who uh, not only invented set theory, which is, is so important, but also in, uh, invented the Cantor set, which is one of the 
fractal forms where if you take a line and you take you remove the middle third of that line and then you keep removing the middle third of each of those lines you keep going and you wind up with a thing called canter dust which are a series of, of, of points but you can keep pulling it out and so canter invented different forms of infinity we thought there was only one form of infinity but it turns out there's an infinite forms of infinity you know the infinite number of forms of infinity and certainly fractals ca capture many of those forms of infinity since they they are they do exist between each dimension and in fact there's a whole now uh, kind of dimensionality called fractal dimensionality that can measure the complexity of an object um, and it's got some practical uses so for example Richard Taylor who is a physicist has uh, authenticated Jackson Pollock art by measuring the fractal dimensionality of the art and seeing whether it matches um original, etc. There's also really some, some very interesting um, things about artists as they age, that the dimensionality of their work tends to decrease over time. So this is, this is something that unifies uh, qualitative, subjective kinds of understandings of the feel of an artistic piece with more quantitative ways of capturing the, the, those uh, subjective feelings. Now, this is a very important point that you're making, and it reminds me of one of the chapter titles in your anthology about fractal epistemology. I think the chapter was titled More Than a Metaphor, because a, a lot of people might think, oh, it's this is the latest New Age buzzword, and, and people are going to be talking about fractals, but it's all just meaningless talk. It's all just sort of a, a social pattern, but because it's wedded to a very precise a rigorous, extensive branch of mathematics, and also because we see these patterns throughout nature, and especially within the human body, uh, to, to regard our discussion as being just another poetic way of, of looking at the human being w would be a serious mistake. Absolutely. That's a really, really good point, a very, very important point. Um, on the one hand, more than a metaphor, because fractals are also a method of doing science. So there, there's a whole nonlinear form of statistics that, that, um, look at distributions in terms of fractal distributions in time. So for example, the distribution of um, wealth among people follows a power law, which is a fractal pattern in time. The pattern of earthquakes is a really good example, also follows this kinds of kind of distribution or the distribution of population of people in cities, um, small, the size of the city versus the number of people or the use of words even um, in our discussion follows a fractal power law. So it is a very, very natural um, distribution that that is highly te technical, that is um, a method for looking. Um, it's a metaphor and it's also a model. So there's every single level of application that is possible. But at the same time, I wouldn't dismiss metaphor as um, only being poetic because it turns out that all of mathematics itself may be metaphorical. In fact, everything may be metaphorical. Um, there's a lovely book by uh, Nunez and Lakoff about mathematics as metaphorical, and even a concept as basic as number is metaphorical because depending on how you define a number, whether it's points in a line or objects in a group or, um, or a counting object, depending on how you define it, whole different branches of mathematics exist, and some of them contradict with others. And so one of the big things that fractals do, do is uh, they allow for paradox and contradiction, which 
ordinary thinking does not. And our society, as we get more and more polarized, people get more and more divided by, by differences instead of seeing how opposite things can go together which fractals allow, and they also embody and embrace ambiguity. And that's really important, too, because unless we can sit with uncertainty, we're going to drive ourselves crazy. We've covered a lot of ground here. But before we conclude our interview, I want to probe a little more deeply with you in terms of paranormal events. Uh, mediumship, spiritualism, uh, the possibility of survival after death is a big one that seems to divide the scientifically minded people from the spiritually minded people uh, quite a bit. Do you, do you think that the fractal epistemology will help us to uh, reconcile uh, questions like uh, human survival after death or reincarnation? Yes and no. So the no part of that is that, especially that question that you are bringing up of, of life after death or consciousness after death, I don't think we can prove it using any fractal epistemology. So that's the no place. But in terms of modeling, one of the really important one of one of the really important implications of the epistemology that has to do with the action at the edges that I mentioned is that the edges of a fractal tend to be interpenetrating, which means that the two sides of a fractal edge um, you, that each each contain the whole of the other, and. That gives us a way of understanding whether it's the edges between self and other, inner and outer, um, life and death. It does give us a, a natural model for understanding how we can reach over into the other side. So one of the um, controversies, and one, one of the really um, raging controversies, I would say, in, 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 in philosophy um, is, is the hard problem of consciousness, for example. And while I don't believe I've solved that hard problem of, of consciousness, um, I do believe that by showing the possibility of fractal edges between inner and outer processes or between self and other, that it informs the hard problem and allows us to reach more deeply into subjectivity and connect it with outer processes more easily. So I do think that the it does become a, a, an important way to model some of these things. When you talk about the importance of the edges, I'm reminded of the seashore as being a, a great example of a fractal that actually, the, the more you look at it, the seashore is actually infinitely long. You, you cannot put a, a finite length on it using uh, a fractal analysis. And the other thing is that when you're right at the edge, you don't know whether you're on shore or whether you're in the sea. Exactly. That's the interpenetration that you can feel with your own body right at the edge of the seashore. And that that is such a perfect example, Jeff, because um, Jung looked at that edge in terms of the edge between the unconscious of, of the ocean and the conscious of the ego as one. Winnicott was another really famous psychoanalyst who... Um, who studied, who kept returning to a Tagore poem, a little fragment about children playing on the edges of infinite shores. And he came up with this notion of transitional space between mother and baby and believed that the all the origin of, of self and symbol and society comes out of that transitional space. And that is a precursor to truly relational a truly a relational approach in psychotherapy where both people are present at the same time and interpenetrating. Um, 
So when I'm working with someone, I have that person fully inside me and they have that, they have me fully inside them if anything is going to happen. And if that's not happening, then therapy is going to go nowhere. And so all of these ideas fit very, very beautifully into uh, that image of the seashore. Another point worth addressing before we close is the esoteric statement, I think it comes from the Hermetic writings, as above, so below, that uh, one might say, the, uh, in biblical terms, one might say the human is made in the image of the divine, for example, that uh, our connection with this larger realm, however you define it, uh, uh, the super sensible realm or heaven and hell or uh, uh, there's so many different names for it, but the uh, idea of the fractals suggests that the, the patterning can go on at many different levels simultaneously. So it's not just mystical nonsense when uh, somebody says, I am one with everything. Absolutely. As above, so below is a perfect example of the spiritual application of fractals, which really do also model the whole Buddhist approach of, of interconnection between everything and interdependent arising of everything. What, one thing interesting, when people tend to visualize um, as above, so below. They often use the image of a tree whose branches wind up um, in self-similar repetition with the roots of the tree. And so a tree, the world tree, is a very famous image of, uh, for religious, many different religions have the, the tree as the central, as the central um, figure and I, I do believe it's because the branching pattern is is the same branching pattern of rivers of roots of branches um, but also of the circulatory system or of our neurons and the axons and dendrites and the branching patterns there and the cell assemblies and um, and the networks of people and I mean it's just it is. It is, there is a oneness about that pattern that is, that goes all the way up in scale to the most global and all the way down in scale to, to the tiniest levels. And, and so, um, I think it's easy to, to hook our minds around the spiritual applications of fractal geometry, unlike um, while many, many scientists have had a, had a feeling of God in their discoveries um, and, and around the creative process, here we can have a feeling of God around the very content in, in a, a whole new way that both bridges science and spirituality and psychology. Well, Dr. Terry Marks Tarlow, this has been a very enlightening conversation about an extremely important topic. I'm delighted to be able to share your knowledge and your wisdom with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Terry, thank you so much for being with me. Oh, and thank you so much, Jeff, for the invitation and for your amazing platform to make these ideas so much more widely available. I really do appreciate being able to participate with you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.